for the wrong positions. Sorry. Just um, and uh, the third one, because he changed the design, I can't use. So I, I wrote back to him. I said, you want me to send these back to you? Because I can't use them. <laughs> um, so what I did was I finally did some research. And I think what I can do is I'll just fiberglass over the part where it's um, weak. And uh, it's, it's polystyrene. So I'll just get a, um, an epoxy or um, you know the the right stuff that'll bond to that. And yeah, the epoxy that'll bond to uh, to plastics is yellow in color. It's not. It's translucent. It's not clear. Yeah, but uh, now that I know what the plastic is, I can I can go to like 3M and you know ask them. Okay, it's this. It's um, ultra ultra high molecular weight uh, plastic, and to say, you know. Um, I I need to know what what chemical numbers you know what to buy. And just, You're going to polyurethane, polyethylene. Yeah. Um, polystyrene, what? Polystyrene. Oh, polystyrene. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, polyethylene is a wax. That's virtually impossible to glue no. to. It, <clears throat> is it? Is it's a gap that you have to uh, strengthen, or or is it? It's a curve. Think of uh, a think of a torus that's been cut in half, slight you know, right. bagel, you slice a yep. bagel. Okay, so I need to go put fiberglass over the entire bagel uh, to make it stronger, so that it doesn't um, bend too much when it goes over the wheels. Because when it goes over the wheels, it flexes, and oh, all um, right. it cracks. So if I make it strong, it won't bend. So you're going to fiberglass it? Yeah. I'll fiberglass it on the outside. It's a lot easier than taking everything apart um, um, and fiberglass in each section. And, you know, I might do that eventually, but. Uh, you know, one of the things you can do, and I've done this a lot, is I weld stuff back together with a soldering iron, you know, plastic. <clears throat> and I either embed carbon fiber or fiberglass in it. So the glue that I'm using is the parent material. It's not anything on the surface. Yeah, but I see. I, I need to find out what the material is. And uh, he's I, he hasn't gotten back to me in months as to what the material is. I suppose I could probably cut up the pieces of the of the, of the dome that he sent me, but that's kind of like. You know, I mean, he I thinks this he, is a trade secret. What it's made from. No, he just hasn't gotten back. I don't think he knows oh. enough. This is, he's, I don't think he's. So what serial number is yours? Serial number two? No, it's a fairly old one. <laughs> the newer ones have a lot of improvements like the, uh, the, the, the shutter actually goes in wheels and tracks and stuff like that rather than slides over plastic over plastic and gets jammed up and other uh -huh. factors. Uh, the controllers now are 32-bit microprocessors that properly connect up with the Zigbee, whereas in, in mine, there's all sorts of trouble with connections. So, you know, we help fund his research to make something better. You know, first adopters, and, right? That's war. And you get a poke in the eye with a sharp stick as a reward? Yeah, right. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I get I get reminders from my uh, from my wife that I'm not buying anything uh, again like this. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. <laughs> so make, but, uh, I bet you wonder you probably could have made your own dome without, out of some sort of uh, wood and plywood or something. Yeah, I could have. I mean, um, there are certain things I wouldn't have been able to do that I probably could have a machine shop do, but you know, reading the, the reports, the glowing reports, you know, um, and then it was only afterwards that all of a sudden the users group going, well, you know, I'm not the only one with breaks in it or the, the door leaks or things don't fit or, you know, a whole bunch of other things. 
So if I so, get this working, you know, I'll be happy. I mean, you know, it's, you know, it would be nice to have something like 10 foot in diameter rather than eight feet, but. Uh, so um, what do you think about, you know, like the Jerry sliding roof design? You think that would have been a better way to go as opposed to the, rot the dome? I would have preferred, I would have preferred to go like, hi, Jerry. Uh -huh. like Jerry's design, except for the winds are so intense here that it would have uh, jiggled the telescope. I, I needed, I mean, uh, there are months on end that we have like 20 to 30 mile an hour winds going on. And, uh, so the round dome is more resistant to that? Yeah, it doesn't blow Oops. onto the telescope. It's pretty well shielded. I, I could, there were times I could actually feel the whole, hear the whole dome go back and forth, you know, as the wind gusts were, you know, and it never flew off. It just that, um, um, and you know, I, I hear now a lot of people saying, yeah, the dome isn't round. So therefore the wheels go up on the side a little bit and they put a little pressure on the side of the plastic and that's where you get cracks and other things. I mean, um, had there been something that I could attach to the bottom of the dome where it rotates, that would have been the hot setup. But it, the guy designed it just using plastic. And so, well, you know, it, it would have been if super... you double the thickness of something, you make it eight times stiffer, it goes as yeah, a right. cube. Yeah, right. So, if you and put so... some uh, plywood ribs, you know, cut some circular ribs or arc of and put those around the edge of the inside, you can probably force it to be a, a, a much, much more of a circle. Well, um, probably gluing them on the outside so that they don't bend out. It doesn't bow out. That probably would be the, you know, I was hoping to get a 3D printer by now and just print out a bunch of um, gussets that, that glue on, on, on the outside. That would have taken care of everything. But, you know what you uh, do is you put curved sections on both sides yeah. and bolt them together. That way you're not going to be dependent upon uh, yeah, a glue. Kind of, that, that requires a lot more engineering skill and know-how than I know how to do. I mean, oh. but I think, I think with the, the fiberglass and then I'm thinking about putting um, metallic tape on the inside and just build up about four or five layers should give me enough rigidity. Trouble is the glue and the tape uh, is flexible. It is, but it, um, you got one working against the other, then you build up a thickness that doesn't, tends to be, this has to be stiff enough. Um, you think they could take the high heat there? Yeah. Yeah. You know, actually, you, you don't have to put the curved sections on both sides. You just put them on one side and still bolt them in place. Yeah. Go bend some out of oak. You know, you steam them and bend them so they're round and then. Yeah. Put, but that's know, where it, it would bolt. have to be on the outside where it's, you know, have to, well, even on the inside, it, there's a lot of moisture. So uh, wood's not always the, the best thing. The best thing would be is either plastic or uh -huh. metal. And uh, I don't have an right. English English wheel, and lots of time to learn how to make a like make a fender that looks like a half a donut. <laughs> so Jerry, have you... exactly speaking about Jerry... observatories, Jerry's probably almost online by now. Jerry, did they get it, get any farther with your observatory? Well, the carpenter's been over to frame it and they've got a bunch of steel studs left out there in the yard. So I know they're thinking about it. We went over dimensions today for exactly to make sure that there, there's internal clearance when the roof rolls that it doesn't take the telescope with it. So that's a good idea. No. <laughs> you have uh, a camera in your backyard to keep an eye on things out back? I have the cameras, but not I, they're not put up. We had some cameras uh, in the backyard but they were uh, wire connected, not uh, Bluetooth connected. Mm -hmm. And my wife didn't like the clutter of the wires behind the desk. So we took those cameras down 
we have some cameras to put up in place that have Bluetooth connections or Wi-Fi connections, whatever is appropriate. Hmm. You still um, got to get power to them, though. But th those those ones will be solar powered. Each camera. Oh, really? So they can put a battery in the, in the camera, okay. and they'll run for about. Um, they said it will run for nine days if there's no sun. The battery oh. lasts for nine days. Huh. What so, is that? Uh, and so they, they, we have one of those cameras out in the front, and it works great. And we got three more to put in the back, so I'm going to do that. I didn't put them up because there was so much dust and crap in the air the, because of what they generated for cutting the stone and grinding things. Mm -hmm. So now that that's, we're coming to an end, I'm going to start putting those cameras up. So then, yes, we will have that. One thing that I've noticed with my cameras, I've got, I think, six of them. And... Uh, are spiders, spider webs. Yes. They're, they're I have one, uh, when I look at it, all I see is this spread eagle spider on the limbs. <laughs> uh, I wipe his web off, and then later it's back, and he's back, or she, or whatever it is. Windshield wiper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but little teeny. By the way, the wire cameras, um, I'm getting rid of those if any of you want them. Um, you know what uh, brand they were? Um, I don't recall. There's some market brand from China or, or Japan or something. So they're Isuzu or something like that. Uh, I might be interested. I have one where the half the LEDs have uh, gone out in them. Oh, Our, Mine have just two connections. They've got a pin and sleeve connector for the 12 volts mm -hmm. and then a uh, RCA pin connector for the audio, video. Yeah. Yeah, We each one of these cameras has two connections, has the, okay. the wire and the, and the data for the power and data. And it has a it has its own computer with it, and it has a a play screen, you know, a video monitor, and a mouse. So it has a dedicated. Yeah, so does system. mine. I got two mice on my desk. Two mice. Huh? You need a cat. <laughs> so if you know anyone that's looking for some cameras like that, let me know. I promise my wife. I do. Them. I'll take a couple. Okay, you're right. So, I had a guy arrested for prowling uh, uh, based upon the images that my camera took. What was he in your yard? Uh, it's a long story, but uh, at five minutes to two in the morning, I was downstairs watching TV, which is not unusual for me. And my doorbell rings. And uh, I actually can just push one button on the TV remote and see the uh, cameras on my big screen TV. But I, I got up and go to the door. And, I wouldn't have done that. Uh, I know. Well, I was told by the cops I shouldn't have. Anyway, uh, so I put my foot back at the door and, and open it a little bit. And here's a guy standing on the half wall of my front patio. And he jumps down. He's very surprised. And he says, have you seen my sister? And I said, <laughs> no, I haven't seen your sister. You're trespassing. Get off my property. And uh, I figured he was just one of the local nuts. Because out at IV, we've got some. Anyway, uh, so the next day at 4 minutes to 5 p.m., oh, then I looked at the uh, the video. He didn't come up and just ring my doorbell. He came up to my um, front porch and walked around, cased the place, walked all around. Finally, he walks up, he rings the doorbell, and then goes back, you know, five feet, ten feet off and onto the, the stone wall that uh, is around my front patio. And... Then And then I came out, and the whole thing happened I just talked about. Well, then the next day, uh, um, he comes up, and he walks up my driveway with his finger out, and he rings up, and he rings the doorbell. Well, I came over the intercom then, and I said, uh, can I help you? And he was incoherent. He either said, you're in my house or get out of my house. <laughs> then he walked. Well, yeah, and, and my house faces south. He walks due east over a four foot uh, cement retaining wall to my neighbor's property, walks around the black BMW that's there and tries all the doors, they were all locked, then finally disappears out. Well, I, uh, that time I called 911 because that's what they told me to do. And uh, they, uh, they, uh, they took the report. So then I put a neighborhood flyer out of the two pic the pictures of the guy and what had happened and passed, passed it around in the whole neighborhood. You know, we have a prowler. And a lot of people said, oh, my God, that guy's been in my house. In fact, there were some girls on the next street over uh, 
I was talking to two of them, and the third one comes up, and she looks at my flyer, and that's she says, oh, my God, oh, my God, you see that shawl over there? That's the one he's wearing in your picture. On the basis of my doing the legwork for the cops, they arrested him, but he was so uh, drugged up and nutty that uh, he couldn't go to, they couldn't uh, take him to court. They had to get him, you know, uh, cleaned up. So he finally, after he was uh, able to bring him to court, you know, there was no question based upon my videos and the other, what other people had said from my, my uh, you know, my research that uh, they gave him a choice, 120 days of jail or a year of probation. He took 120 days in jail. The guys, he lived in the caves down at the bottom of our bluffs there. Uh, he stunk to high heavens. And uh, so, you know, gee, he gets free room and board to shower every day and is warm. Yeah. <laughs> That's why he took six months, or six weeks in jail, six months in jail. Jeez. So. Crazy. Has that been six months ago? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is another uh, uh, failing in our, our legal system. Or uh, the cops are all out in front of my house, actually the house next door. And so I go out and see what's going on. And here they got him sitting on the curb. His name was Christopher Ackman. And uh, I walk up to the cops and I said, that's Christopher Ackman, isn't it? Yes. I said, I had him arrested. And they, oh, yeah, I remember that. And I said, well, what's he up here for? Uh, and they said, well, prowling. But, and he's on probation in San Diego County, but we can't do anything you know, for prowling because uh, that's what he was doing. You know, he goes around, tries to steal things. And, he's a professional um, prowler. Yeah. So uh, anyway, he was on probation in San Diego, but they couldn't arrest him here without having all of the paperwork from San Diego faxed up here. And they they told him if it's in your best interest to get back to San Diego, in other words, get out of Santa, get out of Dodge. Hmm. And I haven't seen him again. But uh, strange. Yeah. All right. So did you guys see that the their eighty two uh, degree eyepieces from Astronomics, uh, like ninety nine dollars. I got the hundred oh, degree. Wow. It was it was two fifty. Looks seems like a pretty pretty nice unit. I think they're still yeah, selling those. Degrees. Is that an eyepiece? <laughs> You're talking about an eyepiece? Eyepieces, yeah. The Astronomics uh, has their own brand eyepiece eyepieces coming oh. in. I bought an Astronomics um, uh, 30 millimeter, I think. And uh, it had a whole lot of flare. You know, it, it, it hmm. wasn't a nice crisp image. Think, uh, this is our, what, so they're called astronomics, huh? I know. I think they're actually Astrotech. Is it's their brand, I believe. Oh, okay. Well, okay. I bought Astronomics. That was the, the brand what name. What kind of eyepiece are they? It's are this, they, uh, this stuff right here. Um, I don't think it's 110, but they're all 250. Oh, okay. Oh, that's inch and a quarter. This is oh, inch and a quarter and two inch, two inch. Yeah. I think I bought the. The 20 millimeter had didn't have a 20 millimeter wide. I picked up that one. Mm -hmm. So I guess they're going to retail for 300 in the future. Anyone? Anyone? Don't know if anybody's made a review yet of it. What they I got say. more eye pieces than I know what to do with. Yeah, isn't that the I'm case? Not in the market. <laughs> I'm, Somebody I, like. I have um, Explore Scientific, and they are just tack sharp and. Wow. They're the best, the best, they're, they're the most contrasty eyepieces I have, but they're also expensive. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Well, not as expensive as uh, Nagler's, though, right? As what? Nagler. As Nagler's. They're, about, they're about half the price of Nagler. Yeah. Well, yeah, I talked about know, Charles Schumer has it's that 20 inch uh, Dobsonian, and we are at, I forgot what, uh, where we are out observing. And he had the eyepiece that came with it, which is probably a 50 millimeter fossil. And uh, I let him use my 100, my um, 20 millimeter, 100 degree field of view, score scientific. And he was blown away. He just <laughs> was ooing, aahing, and he went out and bought one. In fact, he's bought, he has the five, the nine, the nine is 120 degree field of view. Um, 
the 20 millimeter I have, oh. and I forget which other, he went whole hog on, on Explorer Scientific. Mm -hmm. They make really good eyepieces. I'm waiting look, to look at them out with a 180 degree field of view. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to see the, the, opt, the aperture on the front of your scope. <laughs> but look at the prices of these things. Oh, yeah. It's, it's eight hundred dollars for a hundred degree from Explorer Scientific. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. They're not cheap. I think they've gone up in price. Um, yeah, they definitely have. Yeah. Um, look, look the, at the nine millimeter. That was, I think, I paid about twelve hundred dollars for that. Wow. Well, this is nine. This is a hundred degree nine, nine millimeter, hundred and twenty degree field of view. Oh, the hundred and twenty. That's a different one. Yeah. I don't know if they produce that anymore. Let's see. It's. Go to explore. Yeah, they got 120. Let's see what Who's it says. This, now? This, this is this is Explore Scientific. Yeah, it's a 12. Okay. Yeah, thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? What did you pay for it, Bruce? Uh, about that. I forgot exactly. Oh, it was pretty expensive. Wow. Pretty amazing. But it's you just fall into the night sky. No matter you know the, yeah. you. Can't, but they're, oh, I bought, I have their 92 degree 17 millimeter. That's got 20 millimeters of eye relief. And that people that wear glasses can use that. All these others have like 12 millimeters of eye relief. And if you try to look at through them with glasses, it's like looking through a straw. Well, now, the Teleview makes a radiant eyepiece, I think it's called, that has very high re eye relief for glasses. Uh, and I, I have but, their. One millimeter in that, and that's my standard, about 25 millimeters. Um, that's, what is the uh, field of view? Like it's uh, it's not it's somewhere around 80 degrees. Yeah, you're talking that, about, you know, you can't you, you can't vote on the laws of physics, unfortunately. You can't. Jerry, are you talking about the maybe vote the, the, on the laws of physics? Oh no. You know, if you want our relief, you can't have the white the field of view. It just yeah. One of these had a good eye relief teleview. I think the Delos have it. Delos is the one? Yeah. Well, that's the one I use for on my teleview five inch refractor for outreach because it's so easy for people to find the image and get to the eyepiece with glasses or without. Let's see. Well, I think that's why Chuck puts his images up on his TV set. Yeah. Yeah. Because his vision, he's got such bad astigmatism, and I'm quoting him, that look he can't look through a telescope eyepiece without, you know, normally with people, I'll, I'll I say, yeah, yeah here, here's the focus. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and focus it for your eyes. Mm -hmm. But uh, that doesn't work for him. His astigmatism just is in the way. And here it shows 20. 20 millimeters of eye relief on this 14 millimeter Delos. Yeah, that's not the one I have. Go to the, uh, go to Radian. See if you can find a Teleview Radian. I think that's the one I have. That's it. They got eyepieces and then Teleview. I don't see Radian listed here. Maybe they quit making them. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Is that an no, inch and a quarter eyepiece? No, it's a two inch. Okay. No, the ones that he just had up there. Oh, I don't know about that. It, it, it looked, was. I uh, mean, the barrel on the back. Yeah. That's inch and a quarter for a 14 millimeter. Yeah, yeah, I just saw that what it looked like 50 cent piece there. Yeah. It's a quarter. Yeah. yeah, there's your radiant eyepiece or Teleview. Chuck's Hawk. I'm curious on my. Uh, um, nine millimeter oh, eyepiece, yeah. 120 degree field of view. Uh, it's a two inch eyepiece, but the uh, first ring in there, what am I calling the, the field ring? It's only, it's like an inch, it's an inch in diameter. It's nowhere near two, two inches. Eye relief, yeah, 20 millimeter eye relief on the radian. Uh, uh, if you went back there. Uh... Oh, wow, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have a 27 millimeter radium. Looks like they don't. But see, look much. at the apparent field of view. It's only 60 degrees. Yeah, that's right. It's not a. It's it's, not there's a trade-off. You can't have both. Right. Well, the uh, the other ones that we were shown, uh, the new ones do have that. Yeah. 
This is 70, 72 degree Delos. Yeah, 72, 20 millimeters. So that's probably one of the reasons why also another uh, on, on the uh, previous page there before you clicked on it, uh, they said that there was a price spike in the type of glass they needed for those uh, radio nine pieces. Oh, you saw it on here somewhere, huh? No, on the previous page to that, on just go back. Oh, here? Okay, why did Teleview stop making radiance? Oh yeah, price spike. What is lanthanum, what is that? Uh, it's a glass. Could you, could you make that bigger? Let, yeah, yeah. Lan, lanthanum. It's an element, a rare earth element. Right. It is, okay. Yeah. It could be like some of the other glasses where the process to make it is so expensive due to toxicity. Either that or they didn't get, the, the volume was too low. So it says they restricted the supply in China. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the, the U.S. Security. suffered from a, from a, you know, the U.S. suffered from a rare earth element shortage when China did that across the board. Well, because right. China, China had and sold the rare earth elements at such a low price that they undercut everybody else. And even though there's a lot of the mineral around the world, particularly in the U.S. and in Australia, China undercut everything. So that industry collapsed completely. And when like they, they then it, it had to build back up. And so all these things, particularly cerium oxide for polishing mirrors, went sky high for right around that time, 2009, hmm. 2010. If, if you take a look at some of those prices, uh, um, when you were look for, for the Dobsonian telescopes, they're going up in price too, if you notice. Um, yeah, and, everything's but, up. Um, the, 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 the guys in Oregon are saying that uh, telescope making is going to become much more popular when people realize that they, they can grind their mirror, you know, and, and make their own telescopes. You're expecting a boom in, uh, in uh, you know, making your own mirrors. Well, that would be nice. I'm skeptical, but it would be nice. Well, if you make those meniscus mirrors at 30 inch, <laughs> that's the way to go. Oh, speaking of 30 inch meniscus, okay. Um, a, a, a recent discussion was on a book called uh, Lightweight uh, Giants by Steve Overholt. Do you remember him? Oh, yeah. yeah, I remember him. Okay. They can't find that book anymore because he stopped publishing it and they're really into uh, into it um yeah I had it was a limited edition, edition limited edition book anyway yeah but he was he was pretty prophetic on a lot of things he was talking about slumpy mirrors and yes um his claim to he, had a, was, he had a 30 inch mirror that he took around to star parties and the schools yes yeah yes and um um and it's called a Magellan, and it was uh, made out of uh, um, thin plywood and foam core. And his upper cage used a bunch of uh, rims from tel uh, from bicycles. And uh, um, he 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 did a lot that um, enabled uh, people to. To, to make really large telescopes. Uh, actually, I got a copy of this book on um, on a PDF. I can show you. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll stop sharing here. Okay. Whoops. And let me get my. Okay. Okay. Does everybody see it now? No. Okay. Not not sharing the right window. Okay, hold a second here. Let me try that again. Share screen. Okay, you see it now? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so he was famous for uh, taking this 30 inch telescope in this festiva. And uh, that's not his real name. His real name's something else, and I can't remember. Huh. And so this was limited. This was all books or something like that. This was his own self published thing. And so one of the things he goes into um, is the, he, he did, did an actually pretty good job of talking about the evolution of the um, Dobsonian telescope from tube to truss. And at this time, um, he talks about the guy who eventually became um, obsession with his telescope. So, um, and right down there um, on the lower right, he shows how he made his upper cage, which was a bicycle wheel, some aluminum flashing and um, embroidery hoop. And so uh, uh, the guy was pretty, pretty good. Uh, he, he, he took off weight where, where he could, like this thing with the Milky Way bar. That's his focuser and his eyepiece. Basically, he took um, a wide angle 65 degree eyepiece and took all the guts out and put it in something else and took something out of an old camera for his focuser for a helical focuser. And uh, um, did, did things. But um, there's, there's a view over here um, of, of the focuser. And uh, he was a big proponent of uh, using the optics out of a binocular for a finder. Yeah. So, so uh, and he had an interesting, he had an interesting uh, diagonal holder. You notice that um, it, uh, it's not really adjustable except for the tilt over here. And he put it really close to where the veins are so that it wouldn't strain things when it hung, you know, because there's a tendency for, you know, torquing of the, uh, the mirror. And also another thing he did was baffling. Um, his telescopes didn't have much in the way of a, a top part in the end. And so he invented this little butterfly baffle that took the place of the upper assembly and uh, gave you some decent baffling. So uh, let's see. And he had some other interesting techniques of putting things together. Um, he had uh, alignment of the mirror from the front, a little with the rod going down there and uh, uh, a way of attaching things. Uh, on the right there shows the butterfly and um, uh, baffling for uh, another version. Did you ever look through any of his scopes? It was okay. Um, I looked through the tills, his 30 inch when he first got it. There was some things that he was working out. It wasn't particularly sturdy. There was some flexibility issues, but knowing him, he probably worked them out. But uh, yeah, so here's the technique that he did for making his uh, his parts, uh, where you Locker. cut out the cut out the um, the thin quarter inch or eighth inch plywood, and then you glued it together. And he talked about how you could more accurately cut this. So you don't use a knife; you use a a coping saw of all things. He says he got very good. Uh, uh, Good results. So it was pretty smooth, um, and also he came up with a glass board instead of formica for his bearings. So, um, so, so some of it's kind of reminiscent of what I did for my telescope. Uh, here's the, the mirror uh, frame where it's basically some aluminum, and he's got the teeter totters for the. Uh, uh, for the telescope mirror. In this case, he actually uh, attached triangles to each end of the teeter totters to give them uh, a nine point flotation. 
because his mirror was uh, very, very small. So there's his Magellan right there and his Festiva. And I think one of the things that he thought out better than I did was um, lugging the mirror around. It was in its own sealed case. I know that in the case of my 14 and a half inch, there's some small scratches on it just because, you know, even though I was trying to be very careful about handling it, you, you, you can get things scratched. So everything. One year I was, one year I was down at the Riverside Telescope Makers um, Convention and Lake Arrowhead and Steve was there and he won an award with his telescope for having the largest telescope uh, transported in the smallest car. <laughs> it's sort of like um, like the cave award for the best dressed the person on the uh, on the field. Yeah. Yeah. So there he shows how to you know do do the sandwich things, and I would imagine that technique you know the type of construction is just as valid today as it was back then. You know, um, you used styrene. Um, foam and uh, skins and uh, put material in, in the right places. So uh, what what is a door skin? What's a door skin? It, it could have been door skin or eighth inch. Um, oh, plywood, yeah, doors with plywood. OK, uh, three so, ply, eighth inch thick plywood made yeah. out of hardwood. Uh, so the, it was, you know, the parts were pretty pretty small and you went into, this is how you make it. This is the materials you get. And uh, so he says something to the fact that, well, you might as well go get your mirror because you probably won't be able to make it. Um, so, you know, for uh, for a homespun guy, he was, he had a, a method. A lot of now, detail. A lot of details, some of it, you know, from other people that are more knowledgeable in telescope making said, well, there, there was uh, some issues with the way that he built things, but he had the right idea, you know, in a way, you know, some of the execution. So, uh, so this book is, is pretty rare. So, but it, it, it kind of makes sense. And, you know, um, if I were to rebuild my 14 and a half inch, I probably would do something like that. Uh, certainly, thin plywood and foam is probably a bit cheaper than doubling or tripling up on uh, nice uh, plywood at the prices that we're seeing now. And um, uh, so, uh, yeah. I, I, I think when you're looking at the top left there, um, um, the the uh, the upper part, I probably still would keep it the way that I made mine, which is out of data board. That seems to be. Are you sharing? Oh, there you go. No, I just put that on. This is on Amazon. They list the book, but it's not available. That's yeah. right. But, so Mike, you could advertise it for five hundred dollars, probably. If I had the book, but I don't have the hard copy. Oh, well, that's true. So it was originally, it was, it says well, paperback. Well, if you guys go to the Simi Valley Library, you might be able to pick up the copy that I kind of dropped off uh, <laughs> when I downsized. <laughs> yeah. Astromart found. Yeah. Come along, connect there. But that's not his, I don't think that's his real name. It's something else. Huh. Yeah, he just, that's, he just went by that as a public thing. Who knows? Mm -hmm. He was a kind of a quirky guy. I never knew him by any other name. When I knew him, he lived uh, in um, east of Paso Robles, about halfway to the Calstar site. Oh, he There's did? A there's a ranch up there, and he had a he had inherited a house from his family up there, and a stipend, and he was trying to live up on a stipend, and it really wasn't very much money. And I think he eventually sold and moved it 
but he took his telescope and he would go on what he called a tour of Western states. And he would call up um, local school districts and arrange to set up an outreach thing with his telescope on their campus, mostly for elementary and junior high kids. And I sort of lost track of him when, because he was a member of the Central Coast Astronomical Society up in, um, my friend Gary, who lived in Napomo, and we'd go to that, that club, their outreaches, hmm. and we'd run into Steve at those outreaches. We need to see if we can locate him, because I know there's some people and, you know, I, I'm sure that people would uh, be interested in the book again. But, uh, mm -hmm. It's it's kind of a it's a little bit dated. It's a little bit uh, specialized, you know. You know, most pub publishers would not want to go and publish something like this. But he he did have some really good ideas. That's interesting because we hit when we um, when he went to the VCAS, he was he came from down south from the San Diego. Uh, um, uh, Orange County, a little bit north of there. Yeah. But uh, you know, if things get tighter, you know, inflation happens. You know, it, it might be uh, you know uh, having some old glass on hand. Uh, might yeah. not be a bad thing, especially if you can make a mirror or two. I had a nice uh, interchange with Explore Scientific, when uh, who is the manufacturer of uh, Charles Schuler's 20-inch uh, Dobsonian, huh. uh, and he uh, always uh, was um, commented on how good was the contrast in my 11 inch and I think I've already told this story maybe um, and I did a little experiment uh, one of our last outings I pulled the uh, dew shield off the front of mine and the contrast got you know way, went way, way down my dew shield has got flock on the inside of it it's you know virtually not doesn't reflect and so I said you know I think you need to uh, you know, put a, a, a dew shield on the front of your your scope, not for dew, but to just get rid of the extraneous light. And uh, we went back and forth, and I had a long chat with somebody named Annie at uh, Explore Scientific, and I wasn't getting very far with her. And I said, well, okay, I have to, I'll just put this up on cloudy nights and see what they have to say. I got a call from Scott Roberts, who is the... Uh, president and owner of scientific of explore scientific and uh, very very informative he talks about baffles putting the baffles down the barrel and i still mm -hmm. think something out in front is going to be better but uh yeah, I'm with, I'm so in your charles camp. is looking into that part i'm in your camp yeah you know we can buy a, he's in fact charles is he we went to home depot he and i and uh we're looking at various materials out of which we could make a front, a lightweight front uh, extension for his uh, scope. And uh, Tyvek makes a board uh, that's used rather than just the uh, uh, film that they sell. That's uh, it's like a foam board. And he was thought about that, and he came over. He was over at my house, and I said, "Well, you know, you can bend foam board." So I took. I have some quarter-inch foam board that I bought from. Uh, one of the art supply places for use making uh, posters. And uh, I took my heat gun and heat up one side of it. And if you're careful, you can, you can bend it, you can make it round. So that's what he was gonna go do. I did that for my 11 inch in my observatory. Ah. It does work pretty well and it's very light. <laughs> yeah. How thick is the foam board? Quarter inch. Eight. Yeah, Quarter, something like eighth. that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 the stuff that kids use for uh, you know show and tell at science fairs and stuff like that. How do you hook it to the front of your room? Actually, what I did, I Velcro. made it. To, Velcro. Mine was just barely. It, mine's a slip fit in the front of the corrector plate. 
it stays what I've there. done on the uh, dew shields that I've made for my eight inch and my five inch is that uh, you you, uh, you, you uh, the, the joint, the seam is Velcro. So you bring it around and it sticks to itself. And then where it goes around the telescope tube, uh, I uh, use, um, again, some Velcro. And then I bought the uh, elastic band or whatever you call it, you know, the stretchy stuff that uh, you can buy it uh, like Michael's one inch wide elastic uh, stretchy stuff. And I just uh, glued that to one side of the, the tube and then I put a little patch of Velcro up probably 120 degrees around from that and I pulled it up and I, I put it on there. So it holds itself tight. You know, it, it's, it's self adapting. Yeah, mine, uh, mine's just a slip that I, I got it such that it was just exactly the right fit. Of course, I don't have to deal with too much wind because it's inside the dome. You're but... lucky. <laughs> there have been times that I've taken off the uh, dew shield because the, it's, it's too big of a sail. Your image just keeps moving around. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that Steve Uvelholt uh, talked about was that butterfly um, baffle, because when you think about it, you can make it rather large and it won't matter too much in the way of diffraction because it's right where, you know, it's right where the, uh, um, the veins are for the diagonal holder. So it doesn't add much and you could, you know, make it six inches or a foot high or low and it, you won't see anything. So. Uh, it didn't um, block that much light coming through the telescope? Oh no, you're talking about, you're, you're talking about some, some thin plastic, yeah. a millimeter or two thick. It won't block any more than the edge of the spider does. Or much more, yeah. Just a continuous. Yeah. continuation of the spider wing. Right. Okay. And you know, I see the spiders where they're circular. They're a, a part of a part of a curve. So yeah. that way there isn't any straight lines to give you a, a distinct yeah, but, uh, but the total the total uh, the total loss is actually due to the amount of area in front of the mirror. So you could you could actually have more um, more diffraction, but it's more diffuse. Right. So it is not, you don't get uh, a star, you know, the, the crosses and your stars don't yeah. have right. crosses on them. Which is too bad. I think it looks good. <laughs> but also, if you're a, a really hardcore planetary observer and you use a Newtonian, um, you want to stay away from circular spiders because they take the diffraction, they produce a diffraction too, just like the straight ones do but they spread that diffraction pattern out over the whole field of view so they slightly right. lower the contrast okay. everywhere in the field of view if you have the straight ones then and you put your object in the pie shape between the diffraction patterns for the straight ones you'll actually get a higher contrast region that you can use to look at fine planetary details now my eyes are not sufficient and never have been that i could discern that amount of detail and things and be critical of the two types of spiders. But I've talked to people that are very adamant that they can see more if they use the Newtonian with the straight bars in them. Well, the, the, the best way is to put a window in front. Yeah, a cassie grain, and then you don't have any right. spider. That's true. Well, not a cassie grain and Newtonian, because a cassie grain implies a larger uh, secondary. Yeah. Yeah, but with a Newtonian, you still have to you have to support that secondary mirror. You drill a hole and stick it in the center of the window. window. Oh, I see. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, and it also keeps your mirror clean, your main main mirror. Yeah, but the window gets dirty, so you got. Yeah, I bet you can clean the window a lot easier than you clean yeah. your mirror. Yeah. I'm not sure if uh, you have to really have much of a anti-reflection coating on the uh, on that uh, on on the window it, it uh, it's probably in the mud probably what do you think Jerry you use you lose um, every glass surface you pass through if it's not a coated surface 
you lose 5% of the light. So but, you code it, you can get that down to a fraction of one. But I'm talking about contrast. Yeah, contrast is Same not going to have any effect. It's just going to lower the brightness slightly. Yeah. So oh, no, you get it, uh, multiple reflections off the two surfaces of the glass. It tends to if you do it badly, yes, yeah. Contrast. Yeah. Pardon? If you do it badly, yes. So one of my projects in the future is to make like a F8 or F6 8 inch Newtonian because I have um, an optical window that was part of a a Casa Grain. Uh, uh, camera for tracking for Point Magoo where it they they used um, Novak stuff uh, for the for the primary and the secondary um, they they basically took a Newtonian and put the diagonal really close so it just went out the back in other words had they just done it out they didn't want to put they didn't want to put the camera to the side. They wanted to put it out the back end of the telescope, probably because the, the camera was too heavy. And so I've got that optical window. So all I need to do is get the reflection, uh, uh, the mirror part off and just, you know. So the secondary, the secondary was a flat mirror then? Yeah, it was just a flat mirror. Was yeah, it, that's, that's called a folded Newtonian. It was like 30 or 40% of the area of the, of the window. And it goes back out a hole in the primary. Yeah, yeah that's a folded Newtonian. Yeah. That's that question called a Nasmith mounting, where it actually goes out through the the, uh, the side. declination axis of the scope. Yeah. So your eyepiece is always in the same place. Yeah. It's roughly the idea, similar idea to a Dobsonian, because the Dobsonian, the eyepiece is always you look straight in, just at different heights. It's so always at the wrong height. <laughs> right. well, That's why you put half steps on your ladder. <clears throat> so you can get your eye right, you know. Yeah, at the right place. All right. So no, no one's buying my uh, solar, extra solar telescope I have at the, the uh, sun spotter. Is that it? Yeah, it's yeah. pretty clever the way this is. They fold this oh, up. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember you when you bought that. Yeah, it I bought projects two an image on that ground glass in the back. It no, it it actually puts you just put a, a sheet of uh, good paper on the bottom here. Oh, and, I see. Uh, okay, okay. It has clips to hold the paper in place. You have little circles so you can get this. It helps get the sun's image. In the right spot, uh, it's got a focusing uh, threaded focuser right here that you move up and down, and even the front opening, evidently you can move it. I've never been able to move it. It can move in and out a little bit, and so it, so it actually right uses a lens and not a pinhole. That's yeah, right. so it comes in, hits this guy, hits this guy, hits this guy, and comes down yeah. and, and projects the image down here. Neat. And this is and you get folded refractor. Little little uh, sunspots you can see. It's it's you know it's it's pretty primitive in a way, but it's it's pretty pretty clever too. But it's you know I, it you know kid would uh, get a lot of pleasure out of that or or uh, somebody who acts like a kid. Actually, a retired uh, teacher uh, gave me one uh, when I moved up here. She had two, and she gave me one. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're selling for 475 at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. It's like, holy smokes. But I found a good deal, but I'm advertising for 300. Although I'd sell it to somebody else for in a club or somebody knew me for 175. But like, due to the shipping costs, that they, you know, UPS shipping is not cheap anymore. I noticed that, yes. Gas prices and uh, more benefits. Anyway, it's... I've put it on Craigslist, but don't haven't got any real responses yet. I'm surprised. I think somebody would try to hit me up on it. It's a, it's a great little toy for some kid. Yeah. Some kid, you know, look at the sun without looking at the sun. <laughs> and all the sunspots that are going to be coming up nowadays with the 
increase in sunspots is a perfect time to have one. Mm -hmm. Let me know if you want to convince anybody to buy something like this for me. Okay. <laughs> I like the neutral density five filter on the front of my big scope. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, a little sharper, but that's too big. It's neat the way they made the triangle because you get, it's got a little lock uh, to hold it in place. You can lift it with a handle on top. Mm -hmm. Pretty clever. So, Mike, you still have yours or not? Yeah. Okay. I've got it in its original shipping container. Every so often, I, I took it out. Safely stored away in your garage forever, huh? Um, but the shed. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's getting packed full of stuff. I I I need to. Uh, I, I I need to disassemble the 14 and a half inch uh, star tester and think it about making something much more breakdownable, you know. Mike, do you have a garage at your house? Yeah, I do. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. But it's got stuff in it. <laughs> <laughs> a cars? Uh, a car and a uh, and a golf cart. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the Yukon's outside where the paint job's getting kind of flaky. Um, I, I have, it, it's a good thing because that gives me enough room to do my uh, polishing and testing inside the garage where it's relatively hmm. stable. Now, the one thing I'm going to do, and we went to Ikea to go get a a bed for the front bedroom, which they didn't have because of shortages, um, mm. was uh, in the kids section, they have the um, little play uh, play tunnels, you know, with a spiral in the, in the fabric. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just thinking about getting a couple of those to, to make things more steady, you know, when I do my testing. Because there's a lot of air movement in the garage, no matter what, you know, it gets kind of stable, but you can see things shimmering. Definitely would help out on the. Uh, Foucault because there are vents in the garage, so you get what? some wind or. Yeah, there's vents and, and also yeah. wind gets in because the wind gusts get through the door, right? Underneath and around. So it would be. Would be be nice that they, they, they weren't expensive. They were like 15, 20 bucks a piece. All I need is a couple. Did you get new new earphones? Um no, these are other old ear, earphones. These okay. are the ones my my son son gave to me because he didn't want to take them to uh, uh, Miami. That was about eight years ago. I have the other ones which are the wireless yeah, the ones you normally have are, are quite big and black. These. Yeah, yeah those. <laughs> the, the Sennheisers. Well, those are uh, wireless. These are wireless. They sound pretty yeah. good. And uh, I normally wear them a lot, but I happen to, I happen to have this hanging up uh, along the side here. If you take a look here, there's my wall full of uh, hangable uh, stuff. <laughs> It's my room, so I can do that. <laughs> so, you know, I've got all the, the different charging cords and other things handy because uh, I can. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I could actually take you on a, a short tour of my Here's home. my room. <laughs> Here's my room. <laughs> wow. It's, it's, Those Costco, it's, it's, Costco shelves. Okay, so. There's all my books for technical stuff, uh, electronics and ECM. And this is my ham stuff. And fast, faster after 50, I bought that when I was 65. Uh, that's a book on bike riding. <laughs> okay. The, the Hebrew stuff, my uh, stuff that I do. And here's all my my books, which I never thought were valuable, but which are extremely valuable now, you know. Okay. 
and more telescope books up here. You know, a bunch of signed Richard Berry stuff. And over here is my programming and mathematics book. My, you can see my physics books up there. So, and so when I came here, um, next door neighbor is very handy with the school <laughs> saw. Just need some space. You yeah, still have all one. your college notes? Uh, strengths of materials only. Okay, oh, and on that wall yeah. is a, uh, a, a carving my father did um, while World War II. It's actually um, a um, munitions uh, uh, You need crate. to aim a little bit lower, Mike. Yeah, right there. there. Yeah. Okay, that he, he did. Well, you know, um, in the in in the in the Pacific, so uh, so hmm. that's it. Not much hey, else did, to show. I, your dad, a lot of good your dad, there. <laughs> your dad carved that while he was in the ship in the in the Pacific. Yeah, here. Let me bring it uh, right there. One second. Sorry for it. And that's why I use galaxies in my background. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so what else is new? What else is going on? I got a few minutes before nine. Oh, I okay, what's IDWO so, stand for? Iwo Jima? Yeah, that's the, okay, right there, see? Well, great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some and, thick uh, wood. Here, this, it is is what, this is what my father looked like when he first joined the Navy. Yeah. Is that a beard? It was a beard. They had beards in those days. So is that, wor is that World War One? <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> it's <a civil> war. <laughs> it yeah. saves on shaving, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, I think that was also uh Thumbing, thumbing your nose at the man, you know, so to speak, because during battles, you know, the navies allowed guys to go grubby just because they were fighting, you know. Mm -hmm. Let's see what's happening. Um, I'm going to try and uh, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, stripping the coating off the 14 and a half inch mirror. And uh, working on it again. And Jerry, you said uh, a little bit of Drano will do it uh, for taking the. I don't know if they've changed Drano formulas, but this is what I used in the '60s and '70s to get uh, uh, the aluminum off of the mirror. Was Drano sodium hydroxide, right? Yeah, basically. Okay. Not not a lot. You just put it in there, and you should get uh, within a few minutes. You should get. Uh, uh, action to start seeing the aluminum go away. You don't okay, want to even if it's uh, silicon overcoated, right? I believe so. Yeah, silicon. And that time it was silicon monoxide overcoated. Now you don't want to leave it in monoxide, too long because uh, it will start crazing the uh, glass. Yeah, it's too strong or too long. What about uh, ferrous oxide? I never tried any of that. There might be better ways to do it than Drano. Yeah. Ferrous oxides, uh, the stuff you need. Yeah. What about <clears throat> Yeah, so I'm going to start in on on that uh, fairly shortly because I want to I want to improve the mirror. I want to get the stroll ratio up a little bit, at least close to what my 10 inch one is. So, so Mike, were you using your interferometer on the 14 inch? I can't remember. Yeah, it wasn't even giving me a number for Strill. It was that bad. So, uh, is this um, on thin glass, the mirror? Yes, thin glass. And that really was porthole glass? Yeah. And porthole. That means from, it's sort uh, of line glass. Right? Yards up here uh, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the back bay here. Yeah, they were, I mean, there's still a couple ships. They, kind of salvage every so often. But back in the 60s, they were 
they were salvaging a whole bunch of uh, transport ships in Susan Bay, you know, uh, uh, near there. That's where that's where Dobson and uh, a bunch of other guys would get their glass. That's where yeah. that's where Mike uh, Mike got his glass from there. Mike Dilly. who? Dilly. Mike Dilly. What size was his? Was that 14 also? No, he was working on, I think, a 12 inch. Hmm. And he gave me a couple of discs on the uh, couple 14, a, a nine, a bunch of eights, a couple tens or something like that. So hmm. I still have them here. So one of my projects is to, to make an eight inch, you know, planetary reflector, you know. See if I can get it working good. First, I got to go finish the first telescopes, you know, like Jerry. <laughs> Jerry's good. Jerry's yeah. almost done with his. Years what is a telescope that you have taken a lot of those uh, pictures with? Oh, that's the um, that's the um, I have a C8 and a C11. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Yeah. So it looks like people are just making flat mirrors for just to put on the wall. Yeah. Using old porthole porthole metal. Yeah, they're decorative. The trick Except with porthole for... glass is you know that it's it's plate glass because it's yes. greenish. And uh, the thing is that it's not not necessarily annealed well. And if it's not annealed well, then you could as you relieve as you remove glass the thing can flex in response to the stress lines being cut. And so the, uh, it's hard to get a symmetrical, rate, rate, uh, circular symmetric in a piece of glass if it wasn't annealed well. And the porthole glass is randomly annealed, so you have to just try it and see if it works. They talk about that in the original amateur telescope making books one, I think. So it looks like corneal. I guess you could still... always anneal it. Yes, they can, you can do that. A lot of people do that. A lot of people that they, they slump mirrors because you don't have to heat it up to melting. You know, glass doesn't, glass isn't really a solid. It's just uh, you, by heating it, you lower the viscosity. And at some point it'll slump, but it also will, if you cool it down, because the annealing is just getting it hot and then cooling it down slowly so that everything has a chance to adjust, that you don't get a heat gradient. The outside doesn't cool real quick while the inside is still hot. So I just cool it down real slowly over several weeks or a month. You could put in an, uh, on a turntable in there too, so you get a parabola automatically. Yeah. Yes, people do that. That's what the University of Arizona does with their 8.2 meter. Yeah, the yeah. Dr. Angel. Yeah. Looks like Corning is still doing mirrors. Low expansion, lightweight, few silica. Uh, do you do you take a risk of having the mirror shatter or the glass shatter as you bring it up to do the annealing? Um, you always it depends how fast things go. Uh, you always have a risk of shattering with glass, if you, especially if you build in stress lines um, by cooling it too fast. Then, you know, a simple scratch, can they make the thing explode? Oh yeah, yeah, like tempered glass. Yeah, that's exactly what you get is tempered glass if you don't need <laughs> it. Like. So where, do, where, where does one get inexpensive uh, glass blanks for uh, telescopes nowadays? I don't, I don't know, but the, what's its name, Newport, sells um, borosilicate float glass, which is um, the generic term for Pyrex. And they do an extra annealing on it to make sure that it's annealed. So it's, it's doubly annealed or fine annealed as they call it. And that's where I got my 18 inch and my 14 and a half inch blank. Now, how plain are the surfaces? They're, they're roughly plain, just molded. You have to start hogging it out. Or you can you can give them extra money and they'll find they'll grind it you know rough it out to a, close to a certain shape 
if you pay an extra hundred bucks or something. But you still have to do the rough grinding on it because they, they usually curve it to 200 grit. But the grit has a, uh, or the mirror has actually a point, little volcano shaped thing in the, in the center. And so you have to grind that off with the, the grit that they use 200 before you can start really working on the mirror shape. It saves a, it saves a lot of time in removing a lot of glass. Is that what you did? I, I, I paid to have it a certain shape preformed on it. I have, if on the 10 inches uh, I've done before and the eight inch and the six inch, I start from just the cast blank and I do the hogging out as they put. You know, I start with 60 grit and just grind it like mad, you know, just hollow it out. It's a long time. It's probably the longest single stage in wire grinding. Actually, with uh, with the fourteen inch, I did it mine pretty quickly, um, because I I took me about a a week uh, using. Uh, I showed you the um, diamond studded uh, grinding wheel on a on a on a small mm -hmm. uh, weight, and uh, did it pretty quickly. I think I lost some hearing as a result of the two because it really made a lot of noise. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I suppose that due to demographics and uh, actuary scales, there's probably some nice pieces of glass to be had at relatively cheap estate prices by widows. Huh. Or glass, in my view, is the most casual and difficult people to work with. <clears throat> they don't return calls. You sort of catch someone there, or, or you don't. They're not saying the sizes here. Oh, they have a list of them somewhere. somewhere. Go back to the previous materials applications, home capabilities and services. Right there now in glass and optical material, go down to there. Click on that. Yeah, click on that. You just oh, that's where you were. Cape Billy Sir Home Materials. Applications. Look for applications. Applications. Doesn't look like they linked anything here. Okay. Well, their casualness has spread to their website now. <laughs> Okay, one second. They said float, but they're like two inch mirrors they're talking about. Yeah, that, yes. Um, fuse silica that and Pyrex up there. You saw Pyrex. That will be for um, largely for uh, mirrors. But float glass is in a big sheet. They, they car, yeah. they machine out circles in it. Yeah. Yep. And the sheets that they made in the sheets come in certain thicknesses, usually one inch, one and a half, five inches. So my 18 inches, 1.75 inches thick. Yeah, okay, well, this one's only one and a quarter. Hmm. Okay, well, we've broken past nine o'clock. Should we call it quits? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. See you guys next uh, week. See you next and, Monday. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if we can, how we can encourage more people to attend. It'd be nice, but. We had a few fall out. I guess they're getting too uh, busy taking images. Yeah. A windy day. I didn't get any takers on the uh, laser pointer business that I had looked into and was, you know, make parts for. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I bought those uh, laser holders and lasers from eBay. Well, the lasers hasn't come yet, but the holders came. They came so quickly. I, they came yeah, like a day yeah. or two days. Yeah. The lasers, I think, take a month the, the way they show them. The middle of, middle of March. Days at most. Well, that's the thing I've noticed. You know, they say that it's going to be delivered 
two or three weeks out, and they arrive in four days. Sometimes. Yeah. But you the lasers didn't come that quick. All right, guys. We'll talk to you soon. See ya. Talk to you later. Bye now. Good night, Bye. all.